Hey, folks. Hello. Hey, guys. <laughs> Friends, colleagues, good to see everyone in the Big Apple. I'm Greg. Gregory as well. And I'm passionate about helping founders build bubble-centric startups. We're talking about design systems today, scalable design systems. That's a component. Let's move the notes. But before we get to the scalable part, I do want to talk about what, what is a design system? What is this thing that Greg bangs on about all the time? Because I know you guys want to build. We've got logic, we've got databases, we've got all this cool stuff. Drag, drop stuff, put stuff on the canvas, just get it done, get it shipped. We don't need a design system, it's too much work. But I see the bubble ecosystem growing and I see teams forming and I see, I see big projects starting to launch. I've got no notes, so I'm freestyling here. Thanks. OK, let's play a game. Hands up to those who believe the statement. Good UI design can double your profits. Who believes me? All right, OK. So 60, 70%? Hands up. Who believes the statement? 300%. OK, far less. Looks like about 10, 10% of hands. Forrester Research, they looked into this over a long period of time. And they discovered conversion rates up to 400%. Good UX design, good design practices. McKinsey, correlation between good design and increased revenue across basically Fortune 500 companies. The Design Management Institute, big companies like Apple, Coca-Cola, design-driven companies, they outperformed the S&P 500 over a long period of time. And lastly, everyone loves talking about Airbnb myself included, and they saw a substantial increase in user engagement and bookings via their redesign back in 2014. Sure, but what about, does this apply to everyone? What are the edge cases? I couldn't find any research that said great UX design or UI design leads to less revenue. I really couldn't. But sometimes there are edge cases. This is BerkshireHathaway.com. <laughs> Unless you are Warren Buffett, you probably do have to worry about, or not worry about, but place attention on design for your startup. This is how I would describe a design system, with a focus on cohesive and systematic. Because no company no system, no team can scale without robust systems in place and without cohesion. Give me some design systems outside of tech. Architecture. What else? Shipping, logistics. Music, fashion, manufacturing. Urban planning. New York, what a great example of a design system. High throughput, people get where they need to get to as fast as possible. Great example. I'm sure their design system is well thought through and robust. Where I come from in rural England, there is no design system to the roads down there. You can't fit a shopping trolley down a two-way road. So where I come from does not scale, it's still a village. So they are absolutely everywhere, guys, design systems. And it's something that you need to think about. 
now that you're starting to work in teams, build out apps both for clients, make some money, and scale this thing called no-code. I hear this all the time. Greg, I'm not a designer. I'm not just naturally gifted. I'm not a surfboard shaper. But I set myself a challenge. And I used a well thought through design system to build a surfboard in five days. Point being is that all of you can be great to UI designers because it's a cohesive and systematic approach that matters more than the natural talent. When I talk about UI design, we're not talking about iconography, logos, you know, illustrations. We're not talking about that. We're talking about interfaces. And that follows the system. Very quickly, the benefits. Improved collaboration, OK? Who's come across this before? I have. Designer calls in sick. Get the tech person to the, create the login form. Follow the design system. Or follow the, sorry, follow, follow the system, but there is no design system in place. This is what you end up getting. Your apps will be far easier to maintain with all of your developers with a single source of truth for them to access. I coined this recently, well, about a week ago. I was thinking, what's a good way to sort of describe when you create an app, and I did this at the very start. Create an app, you don't set up a style, you have a primary color. Because as soon as I create a new app, I'm just so excited about color, I just want that first. So you set up a blue button, and then you don't set a, you don't set a style because you're too busy just building logic and functionality. You create another page. You put in another primary button. And you can't really remember the, the hex code. So it changes slightly, shades of blue. You create another page. Shade of blue starts again. You can see how these problems begin to manifest if you don't have a system that your entire team is working from. It's about constraint. And ultimately, systems enable scalability. For your clients, if, you, if you're working in an agency, well, this obviously improves outcomes for them as well. For your clients' customers, it builds trust. There is a link between good design and trust. Okay? Better end, end user experience, and this leads to increased revenue for your company and your clients. Now, these are some design systems if you wanted to just have a look at how they are constructed. We'll break this down a bit. So where do we start? Now, design systems are more than UI kits. It's not untitled UI, OK? That forms part of a design system. It's not Bootstrap. It's not uh, some of these other frameworks that you've heard of. That is the, the big part, and I'm going to get to that, because I know a lot of you guys want to understand how to work with UI kits or build your own kits. But today, we're going to talk about bubble only, OK? We're not going to talk about other tools. But there are principles and guidelines we need to think about that inform a design system. That's the place where you start. Let's, let's quickly build a design system for a stocks and investments app. Let's just start with the color. Someone give me a color. Stocks and investment. Green, green or blue, what else? Red, OK. Some of the things we need to think about with building design systems, and this is what I used to do having a client meeting. I'd say, what does it do? Who's it for? That's a question you should all be asking. What problem is it solving? What does it do? Who's it for? You need both of those. And these, these need to be in your design system. So stocks and investment app. We heard green, heard red, uh, and I heard blue. So if I said to you, build me this stock and investment app, I'm not going to tell you who the customer is. That's what you come up with. These are two of the most popular, for different demographics, stocks and investment trading apps. So you're on the money with green. That's great. But look at the other one. If we knew the customer, we would be able to start there, and we'll be able to hypothesize from the very beginning, what is the look and feel going to be? 
So we're talking about the customer, guys. Who's the customer? What does this thing do? Not straight into a UI kit. And part of principles and guidelines, you have to ask these questions. How can I reinforce my brand? What's our tone of voice? Or how do I visualize the tone of voice? Is it really bold? You know, what is it? And it even boils down to guidelines such as, you know, how do we handle null state data? Uh, how do we do this stuff? Are we using photography or illustrations? How should we handle app notifications? All of this stuff is documented somewhere. So if developer A and B have crossover with their job, they build a new page, they have a repeating group, that repeating group has no data, what do we do here? And this is where design drift comes in, unless they are all pulling from a central source of truth, your design system. Okay, the fun stuff. Let's dig into this a bit. So frameworks and UI kits, of course. This is what we need. This is the good stuff. Does anyone use, or everyone's heard of Bootstrap, I guess. Hopefully, you have. Um, does anyone use Tailwind or Material UI as a guide for the breakpoints, you know, the sizing, spacing? I see one or two people nodding, three, four. OK, that's great. What I love about frameworks is that it is a, a set of rules and recommendations about how we should approach space, sizing, color, all of that stuff. And those numbers beneath Bootstrap, Tailwind, and Material UI, that points to breakpoints. And I wanted to put this in because those breakpoints are different. So it doesn't actually matter what breakpoints you choose. I've adopted Bootstrap. Bubble uses some Bootstrap breakpoints. But I work within a confined system, and it's easy. Because I only have to remember, well, anything below 576 is, is mobile. So I only have to really remember three or four uh, numbers when it comes to responsive design. That's all I have to remember. I'm never, I never click on the responsive tab. I don't need to, because I know where my breakpoints are, and I know what it's going to look like. And that's well docu documented in my uh, design system. So if we are talking about a UI kit, which, by the way, is built from a framework, if you haven't uh, had a look at Untitled UI for Figma, download that. That is an education within itself of how to, cre to create UI kits. Okay? That's the one thing I'll say about Figma in this session. OK, so user interface design. Let's break this down. So we've got color, topography, iconography, and images. We've got all of our elements. We've got our containers. We've got our spacing, states, interaction, and motion. Let's just look at two of these. In terms of color, when I first started my journey, I did not get this. I love the color palette. Colors are the rainbow everywhere. But color is a tool. Most apps should be black, white, shades of gray. I was in London two days ago walking around, just looking at people's clothes generally, looking into the crowd. And I could see black, white, shades of gray. This is how we need to think about our apps. Be reserved when it comes to color. Of course, if you're building an app for designers, you, know, you can get uh, more experimental. And color drives behavior. It gives feedback to your users. It's a tool. It enables functionality, drives attention. So what I tend not to do is to use red, green, orange in my design, aside from what they're meant for, which is the tool part. I think green would be OK, though. Bubble gives us 32 variables to play with. I use all 32 for the tints and shades opportunity. Really, most apps should just have four colors and then shades of gray. By the way, guys, the last slide will have a link to a free design guide for all attendees. So I'm not going to dive too much into the detail about how to create this, because it'll be in that guide. And this particular color system would look like this in the swatch. So you've got your system colors at the top. Then you've got your shades of gray beneath that, or neutral colors. And then you've got your primary, success, warning, and danger. Nice and neat in the color picker. And though that set of colors is what I use for all of my apps. I don't really feel a need to dig beyond that. This is where I start when I'm looking for my primary color. So take a picture if you need to. UIColors.app. 
they provide all the color palettes you need, or you can put in your own hex code for a primary color, and it will generate uh, the shades and the tints. So what you shouldn't be doing is putting in your primary color, and then if you want a lighter color, change the opacity. You need solid colors. I hear someone laughing. I think they actually do that. OK, very quickly on topography. There is a lot to talk about here, but think about legibility, readability in the forefront. Most tech companies I see use serif font like Inter. That's where I tend to start with Inter, and then I might play with a few other things, OK? Hierarchy is very important with topography. Not just about the size of the text, but color forms a part in hierarchy as well. Responsiveness with text. That's something to talk about and consider, as well as accessibility. Can we read this? Does it stand off the background correctly? And by the way, Google will penalize you if your text uh, isn't, doesn't render well, basically. So there's a, a certain standard when it comes to text and text color to make sure that it is readable and accessible. Generally, if we're talking about topography, your headings are going to be darker, bolder, and the letter spacing will be closer together, and the line spacing will be closer together as well. Easier to read, looks better. As soon as your text gets smaller, starts to cascade down, that text is going to be lighter because of hierarchy. It's less important. So it's not just the size of it. It's the color of the text starts to change to, for instance, a dark gray or a slate. Just a little tip, what I tend to do on, on my uh, text styles, on my H1, H2, H3, I'll have a conditional. That conditional will look to one of my breakpoints, and it will reduce the text size uh, within the style itself. So if we're talking about scalability, this is something that you want to do in a style so that when anyone else in the team is using it, they don't have to worry about that as baked in. Four-point grid system, familiar? Does everyone know it? Does everyone use it? Can't hear you guys. Four-point grid system. Who's heard of it? Yep. Good. All right. So you guys are starting to use the system. That's excellent. And what I love about the four-point grid system is those are the numbers. There are eight numbers there. I could throw in a 44 and a 96. But generally, when it comes to layout and spacing, padding, margin, those are the numbers, guys. How easy is that? Beautiful. You want to see even numbers, divisible by four. I use that for spacing. I use it for button sizing, for topography sizing, element sizing. Basically everything, those are the numbers. Far, far simpler than trying to sort of figure out, you know, what should my padding be? What should my spacing be? Don't worry about the illustration on the left. That's just, uh, just an example of, you know, using these numbers. And you can start to form patterns with how these numbers fit together over time, and it just becomes natural for the way you build. OK, so let's talk about scaling. So how do we, how do we scale? We're working, and what, and, and what does scaling even mean? What are we scaling here? This is my interpretation. Maintaining consistency while accommodating growing needs. But we need to start somewhere. We need to start somewhere. So don't do this. Don't grab a huge color system from a UI kit and try to rebuild it in bubble. You wouldn't be able to do it anyway. You don't have enough variables. But you catch my drift. You start small. This comes in terms of topography with everything. Because when you create your first design system, we start with the principles and the guidelines. And we start to piece things together. If UI kits, uh, how I see some people using it uh, is in terms of the fact that UI kits have scaled. They are fully fleshed out. There's nothing else to create there. And what you're supposed to do is just take what you need from that UI kit. So we're not supposed to be rebuilding a UI kit in Bubble. We're starting small. In terms of teamwork, we want to use semantics where we can. We want to use the English language. Okay. So when you're creating your styles, you've noticed that Bubble gives us uh, 
a label and description. Type out what the description for this color is. In this instance, primary 800 is used for hover effects. I wouldn't just say primary 800. Give it a specific meaning and just use it for that particular thing. This is an interesting one. This is something I've, well, in the last sort of 12 months I've started doing. And whenever, I'm always intrigued to look at someone's editor, specifically how they have named their groups. So if you look uh, at the, um, the naming of the content on the left-hand side. We don't need to name every single group container element with a unique name. That's not how you scale. We need to think about naming conventions and patterns. We do need to, obviously, if anything is, is a, if a button or a container is attached to a workflow, it needs a unique name so we can find it uh, in, in, in the workflow area. But other than that, I use patterns. I'll have group hero section. Within the group hero section is just a content group, group content. That's it. Beneath that would be group title and subtitle. I'll have my group buttons. Keep it simple, keep it simple, and find a reusable pattern that you can use. You don't need to uh, name it uniquely because it's there, you can click on it. And when you get to understand the pattern, you'll quickly be able to understand how things are nested and where they are. So your group here is section, and then your group content within that. Go down to the next part. Group FAQ. Go down to the next part. Group, group blog section. It doesn't have to be uniquely named. And think about patterns in terms of how you actually drop components on the page in this illustration. I have a little badge at the top. Then I have my title, then I have my subtitle, then I have my buttons. And, and repeat these patterns throughout your app. Customers will become used to them and will actually speed up their interaction with what you're building. So when it gets to my sections, I'll always have a little badge at the top, then I'll have a title, then I'll have a subtitle. It becomes familiar for the end user. So this is huge. I'm not sure if you guys realized. I'm sure most of you have, because we've got uh, you know, power users in the house. But reusables now have properties and a detach feature. Has anyone used a detach feature here? All right, so some hands, 20%. The detach feature is huge, because it means we can create our own component libraries. We can literally create all of our components as reusable elements. Anyone in the team can grab it, drop it on the canvas, and detach it, and do what they like with it. We have the ability to create component libraries now. And obviously, with properties, it's just mega powerful with uh, being able to feed different data sources and attach different data sources to reusables. So this is the first thing I did. I created a component library for myself. I can copy that between apps. Uh, but moreover, what I tend to do is I have a master app, and I'll get to that in a second. So reducing friction, again, within the team. You want to bake in as much stuff as you can into your styles uh, and into your reusables, just so that there's no drift in the execution side. So try to reduce the need for conditions on the page, elements on the page. Put them into the, your styles. So I have styles for all of my containers, all of my groups. All of my groups start with 32 pix pixel padding left, right. At the mobile breakpoint, all of those containers drop down to 16 and 16. All baked into the styles, it means that I don't have to then jump into the page and set up my conditions for uh, responsive, because it's done already. Also means I don't even have to look at the responsive tab, as I mentioned earlier. Have a look at that expression. Current page width is smaller than small's width. So what I've done here is I noticed working within teams that people struggled to remember some of the breakpoints and just some of the numerical values. So I created an option set called breakpoints. I labeled them small, medium, large, extra large. I attached a numeric attribute, and I popped in those breakpoint numbers. So then when the developers needed to drop in or create responsive canvases, all they need to do is grab the breakpoint option set and just attach it that way. So 
because at times I'd say, in the beginning I'd say, it's a five, seven, six breakpoint, but I started noticing five, six, seven. It's a nine, nine, two breakpoint, and it'll come back nine, two, nine. So you can use global values uh, in your option sets. Now Bubble is working on a new feature for breakpoints that's going to be incredible when it launches. So uh, that's going to be a redundant slide soon. And this is the big one. All right, don't have time to create design systems. Too busy. Guys, we need to slow down to speed up. So create your master app. That's going to take a bit of time. Get all of your styles done. Create your design system. And then just clone that app when you start new projects, and it's done. It will take a bit of time, but once it's done, it's done. Whenever you start new client projects, you can then just adapt from there. Everything's baked in. This is saving such a huge amount of time if you think about it. If you create your own component library in a master app and then duplicate that app, you can just grab a component, drop it on the page, detach, or change the properties. Good to go. Good to go. OK, guys. Thank you. Um, let's jump to Q&A. While we're doing the q and I'm just going to put up the URL for the free guide for all of you folks. This guide will focus on the UI part uh, and will form part of your design system. But who's, who's got some questions? Let's, ch let's chat for the last four minutes. Someone must have questions. Yes. They, they are, it's getting a refresh. Um, thank you. <laughs> Anyone, any other questions? Who uses, okay, who, who uses um, Figma? Who uses Figma for their design system? Most hands, of course. I mean, yeah, Bubble uses Figma as well. Okay, um, and I think it's a great sort of central repository for this kind of stuff, for design systems. Um, and obviously, as you scale to a bigger team, it does become very useful. Question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so first off, I like seeing your tutorials for like last few months. So it's really cool seeing you up here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very helpful. Actually, I just actually used one of your videos like a few days ago, so it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, so when it comes to design and, and systems, I think there's a balance between using what you know, right? Using what exists in the world, and then also going and exploring and finding something. Mm. What is your I guess, system that you have when it comes to learning new design and when to, I guess, adopt something versus keeping what you currently have? Yeah, great question. And what, what I was trying to, the point I was trying to get to uh, quite early on is that um, UI design is quite repetitive. But this is a good thing. This is a good thing. Yes, we want our apps to stand out, but they've got to be usable, and we don't really want to uh, reinvent the wheel OK, we've got a header section, brand on the left, links in the center, buttons on the right, sign up, login. So I don't tend to sort of drift too much. Um, but I do, some apps might be, I might experiment a little bit with some motion, uh, you know, as it scrolls into the page, that kind of thing. I tend to definitely work within quite a time, uh, tight uh, frame set for that. But at, I'm following a lot of designers. So when I see everyone using Framer, using Webflow, doing these cool things, I think that's a different audience. I think what we're doing, our customer base is different to them. But I do, yeah, I do tinker with some of those ideas. Usually what happens is I build something with animation. When it comes time to launch, I rip it out because it's affecting my SEO score or something like that. So it's just about keeping things simple. Um, yeah, you know, your clients are probably varied. In your contract, it'll probably stipulate that you, can't have, you won't be building for two clients with the same idea. So naturally, it's OK for those apps to kind of look and function in a, in a similar way. OK? Uh, there's time for one more question. Hey, Greg. How's it going? This is A.B. Hey. I learned Bubble, actually, from your video ah. four years <laughs> awesome. ago. So thank you for that. My pleasure. Uh, question. Have you ever come across where you're importing a color from Figma mm -hmm. and does not match exactly with Bubble? And Ooh, why is that? Yes. Why is that? Um, code base, most probably, uh, would be my answer. But the question was, how come in Figma colors might look slightly different to colors in Bubble? 
I'm not a bubble engineer, so I'm going to have to go find out. And actually, I'm, I will ask that question. Uh, I'll find someone in the engineering team. But, 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 but it's OK. It's OK because it might look slightly different, but you can then adapt the color and bubble so that it does match in Figma. So that's what I would do. Probably uh, look at the saturation of that or a particular hue. All right, folks, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. You're going to get the design guide on that link. You can sign up right now. Thank you.